Great. All right. Thanks, Mitch. And hello, everybody. Great to uh, great to be here. Thanks for uh, attending today. Um, so I'm gonna start off by saying fasten your seatbelts. Um, in preparing this, uh, there turns out there's a lot to talk about with this. So today's webinar is going to have uh, it's going to be content rich, and it'll be on me to make sure that uh, I keep the pace uh, appropriately. I just want to give you a heads up. Lots to talk about. It's going to be a lot of good things. So looking forward to this. I'm going to start with the story of Amazon Prime. And uh, Amazon Prime is really, I don't know if you guys, how many folks on the phone have used it, but it has really become a kind of a, 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 a kind of a, my primary basis of how I actually do shopping uh, a lot of um, online. So let's talk about that. Amazon back in the early 2000s, uh, let me talk about Jeff Bezos had really set Amazon's mission to be customer-centric, the world's most customer-centric company, a place where you can find and buy anything you want online. You know, so first off, I just want to say that was a, that's a great mission. It's pretty clear, and it actually put, it really went to the it, it was actionable. You knew that if it's customer centric, that kind of helped guide decisions. Let's go to the right over here. Um, one of the things that Bezos recognized early on too is that their fulfillment capabilities were a competitive differentiator. They'd really done a great job in terms of that, and for him, that actually became the basis to guide his strategy: their fulfillment capabilities. Well, all this is you can get from Brad uh, Brad Stone's excellent book about Amazon. Um, so now, what was interesting is, back then, they actually had an ideas tool. Now, it wasn't hype, but they did have an online tool back in the early 2000s. And it was a place where employees could go to describe their idea. Well, it turns out Charlie Ward, the Amazon engineer, um, he, so he worked on the engineering side. He wasn't in marketing, he wasn't on product, but he was an engineer, which is great. He actually went in there and suggested this. What if we created a shipping service for customers who want things fast and aren't as price conscious? We could charge a monthly fee. Right there, that's the germ of Prime. What happened with the Ideas tool is employees actually started to get enthusiastic about it. There was there was feedback on it. Uh, it was it was it was it was well rated, and that caught the attention of Jeff Bezos. And that's a that's a key that's a key element right there. The senior executive, the CEO in this case, actually was paying attention to what employees were talking about and ideas that came out of there. So. Once it was actually became, as he said, enchanted by the idea, he actually then took the next step. He put in place a, you know, a team to kind of convene and work through it, to evaluate the idea and actually get it implemented. Things like, what are we going to name it? Um, you know, what, when do I have to have it by? How, what are we going to leverage to make this happen? He actually also was really good as a senior executive at clearing the internal naysayers, because that happens. You know, you get an idea, especially something like this, it was a fairly radical idea, and he, you know, inevitably there were people that were grumbling about it. Well, Bezos, a senior executive support, they were actually able to clear aside a lot. He was able to clear the path to make sure the innovation was happening. So Amazon Prime launched back in February 2005, courtesy of the Wayback uh, Internet Archive. You can see here that's the old original logo, All You Can Eat Express Shipping. I don't know if I, I don't even remember that. But there it is. And today, well, 30 to 40 million Prime customers globally. The average Prime member spends over double what a non-Prime customer does. So that's just huge. And uh, just as, just recently, Amazon announced uh, their earnings, um, and they got a 12% stock price bump, uh, pop uh, on that day. And what was the significant driver of it? Prime. Prime actually powered that growth. I mean, this is kind of the dream. An employee comes up with an idea, and he's a driver of the stock, the stock value of the company. This is, you know, they did a lot of things right from, with Amazon here in Prime. I want to highlight some things about the, you know, the story of this, why it worked. Um, first off, there's a mission. Well, Bezos had actually carved out an actionable, clear mission that was actually really helpful for folks to understand what, how, you know, how to act. He laid out a strategic, strategic imperative. He knew those fulfillment capabilities were incredibly valuable, and that was actually a guided strategy. Senior executive support. He actually pulled together the team, and he actually helped cleared out cleared through uh, obstacles to make sure that the idea became a reality. And senior leader engagement. I mean, Bezos actually went to the idea tool and looked at it. He actually was able to actually see what other people said and take that into account in his thinking. Again, just incredibly important, incredibly valuable. And I like this story because it points to how employee innovation programs really can drive incredible value for companies, but it does take top-down support to make bottom-up work. So with that, I'd like to get into the 10 executive mistakes that we're talking about today. All right. And the, what I'm going to do is basically each of these is going to have a similar format. I'm going to introduce them, and I'll talk about this slide in a second. We're going to talk about why, you know, what, why it works, what, 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 why it matters, what, what it looks like when it's going wrong, what it looks like when it's going right, and how to fix things when things aren't going right. So let's start with this. 
poor or no organizational mission. Now the mission is often the, you know, ideally it's the thing that really guides the company. It tends to come from the top. It's the CEO. Often probably I assume the board actually has a hand in it. Um, so that's, a, that's an important element. The mistake is you have a poor one or just don't even have an organizational mission. So let me talk about why it matters. And I pulled this together. I admit I'm just kind of putting, you know, putting together some different figures, but let's just assume that on a, in, for a given hour, your employees have you know, maybe 20 decisions they have to make during the day, so, you know, per hour, small, big, things like that. Over the course of a day, we're talking 160 kind of you know, fundamental decisions they have to make. Now, imagine you're an organization with 5,000 employees. Every day, you've got 800,000 different decisions being made. Now, generally, these seem to go well, but obviously, you can't always be there. So as I note here, executives, the innovation team, you can't be present for every person's decision. So I guess the important question is, what provides the compass that guides decisions on your ideas, those project decisions people are going to make, how you prioritize your work? What is that? That's actually where the mission can really help, because it becomes the touchstone for daily work. Now, I want to just give you some, when I found, came across uh, some examples of missions that are a fail, and as I say here, only one is real. But can you tell the difference? The left one is the mission statement generator. That's actually a website out there. And you know, we officially coordinate ethical leadership while continuing to continually synthesize some performance based. OK, yeah, OK, we got that. The one to the right is our mission is to enhance the value of our stockholders investment hmm. over time by providing quality services hmm. and undertaking any other related businesses in which our resources, particular people, Give the company an advantage. And that's a real one. I've kind of I've taken out some things to uh, disguise a little bit, but that's an actual that's an actual one on the right. And as I ask here, you know, if you're an employee and you've, you're faced with potential innovation decisions, uh, work prioritization, how does the thing on the right actually help you? I would characterize the one on the right as being much more, you know, to the extent they at least have a mission that's that's better than perhaps nothing. But it's very much an inside-out view. Uh, it doesn't actually help guide thinking for employees in terms of what to do. Then I thought I'd pull out a couple examples where it is done right. Now here's Amazon. Now Amazon's updated since the early 2000s their uh, mission statement, but still it's pretty similar, isn't it? To be Earth's most customer-centric company where people can find and discover anything they want to buy online. Well, first off, the customer-centric part, that actually is a hallmark of Amazon. In fact, when they bought the, uh, shoe, the, shoe, the online shoe company Zappos, who was fanatical about being customer-centric, it just was a natural fit for their culture. Google. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Think about that. That actually is a clear, actionable mission statement. It kind of explains things like Google Street View, why they would actually undertake to actually uh, you know, encode all the world's libraries worth of books. Um, you know, Google Earth, as a, you know, which has become a really, you see that used in a lot of like media and things like that. It's uh, it really helped you know a lot of their innovations can all go back to this mission, which is very actionable and very clear, very clearly communicates to employees how you know what the things that are important. So one of the things I you know of this opening thing about the mission, you know, first off, how are you going to fix this? And now this is a tough one. I I, I assume on my um, on this call, I've got a lot of folks that are in, you know innovation management programs. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not talking obviously with the CEOs, but so it's a little glib, but I'll go ahead and say it. Number one, get a new mission statement. Focus on how you help the market and out, you know, basically look at the mark from the market perspective and understand, you know, how are you helping the market? Now, I admit that's a little glib, and I say that in the sense that missions are big deals. You're not, I mean, the idea that you're going to just be able to march into the CEO's office and the board and say, change the mission, I understand that can be a little tougher. Just recognize that would be one thing that, that would actually help if the, your current mission is insufficient to help guide employees. Second is, Focus on the statement of vision. They're often, especially with CEOs, there might be a, uh, well, there might be a, the mission might be something that stands stands the test of time for a while. Uh, the missions can get, I mean, the visions can get updated, and so certainly that becomes an opportunity. Look at the mission. Three, work with the mission statement of individual business units. This, this is really, this actually get, comes into play in, the, in diversified companies. The different uh, business units are going to have different missions, and actually, that's a place where employees are going to have, a, hopefully, if they're well developed. They've got a good sense of what guides their decisions and what makes that particular business unit tick. And finally, for the innovation program, develop a mission statement specifically for it, for the program. Great way to actually take, say, you know what, while we, our overall corporate mission is a little less than uh, uh, inspirational, we're going to actually target, we're going to actually apply one to the innovation program and leverage that. 
So that's an opening thing. So if you, if you feel like you, uh, your particular, your mission statement is uh, not actually helping, helpful for employees in terms of innovation, some options here for you. Number two, strategic imperatives are missing in action. Strategic imperatives are where are we going to go after. So I've mentioned one thing, right, and that helps guide sort of general decision making. But now we have to kind of start getting some focus around our innovation efforts. So strategic imperatives. Some companies, they haven't actually stated that. Now, why it matters. We'll pull out good old Peter Drucker here. Great quote from him. Systematic innovation consists, therefore consists in the purposeful and organized search for changes and the systematic analysis of opportunities such changes might offer for economic innovation. He's basically proposing something that's a little less kind of free form, ad hoc, and uh, hey, it's, it's all kind of a lottery and art. I don't know how the innovation is happening. Just when it happens, I'll know it. He's actually arguing for a much more kind of go after it, much more aggressive approach to determining where you want to actually have innovation. When you have the uh, imperatives, it allows you, you know, basically it allows the innovation efforts to focus on key business needs, um, be in, aligned with where resources are going to be, and also it becomes a target area to help employ, guide employees on where to focus. When you don't have imperatives, this, this is the situation, and I love this quote, when you don't know where you're going, well, any road will get you there. I mean, if you have not actually set out what are the strategic imperatives that are going to help us as a company and the things that are going to allow us to grow in the future, well, geez, you could try anything, couldn't you? And so what you'll get is you'll get ideas that are all over the board. And I just want to call this out here. Innovation becomes un look, you know, can be uneven, random, and ad hoc. And I think that's a chronic condition for a lot of companies. And I think it's somewhat of a, uh, of a, of a symptom of, of a mentality where you say, you just throw up your hands, well, I can't say where innovation is going to come from. It's just got to kind of emerge you know, organically and naturally. And I think that actually you can do much more around helping guide those with the imperatives. When you do have it in place, everyone's traveling the same road. There's a shared understanding of what drives future growth. A executives will actively seek novel ideas for the different imperatives. And you understand where to focus your innovation energies, you know. Uh, today, you know, your, your future. You know, I just these are some hypotheticals, but certainly think about the things that are going to affect the future uh, for your organization. And those actually might be the things that are the smart things if you don't currently have the strategic imperatives, uh, innovation imperatives, to go after. How to fix this? Identify the areas of focus that the CEO and business unit leaders have actually, have, have, that they have. So what, is, what, what actually animates them? What is it they're thinking about? Use the key imperatives established by internal strategy groups. I'll give you one example. One of my clients um, they had actually had a, uh, not with hype, but they had actually brought in like a strategic, strategic uh, consulting firm, like McKinsey or somebody, and they had, one of the things that they, they worked with them was, what are the key mega trends that are going to affect our industry over the next 10 to 20 years? You know what they did? Those became the strategic imperatives, and that's where they wanted to innovate. I thought that was a great use of the, the, you know, that kind of thinking. And then for, finally, in coordination with senior executives, Develop the key imperatives that relate to the company mission and vision. So let's talk about that first one. Assuming you've got a good actionable mission, let's talk about the imperatives that are going to drive you towards that. Okay, number three, sins of the past with program rollouts. Yeah, interesting, sins. So one of the things that uh, well, a lot happens a lot of, especially bigger organizations, is just a series of different types of, in, of, of internal programs. And you know, some potential examples to the left, sustainability, wellness, the old adopt a customer plan. You know, that's a good one, I guess, in general. Uh, the corporate ombudsman, et cetera. And um, one of the things to be mindful of is that you know, employees are focused on their core jobs, particularly after, I guess, what you might call the Great Recession, which I, you know, we, hit, we went through globally. A lot of companies are running lean, uh, and responsibilities have kind of piled on to a, a number of folks that are working. And so just recognize this, and I think it's important. Every additional call on employees' attention requires a decision about the value of participating, and each employee has to make that decision. Okay? And so when you think of it, if you think of it that way, these individual decisions in aggregate, they're ultimately determine the program success, innovation or otherwise. Things that this is kind of what happens, you know, you've got two issues that can happen or, uh, where executives often kind of let, you know, fail, if you will, on the, uh, on the innovation front. First off, program fatigue. Too many programs are introduced over a given period of time. You just, it, it feels like they're just rolled out constantly, constantly. Employees have to learn to tune them out. And in that, in that scenario, an issue would be innovation can feel just like another program. It's like, oh, yeah, that's sustainability, cost savings, innovation. Yeah, okay, I got to get this work done. So that's, let's call that program fatigue. The other is a program with short attention span. You know, these programs get launched and they have a big promotion. They're huge. But then 
this is what, this is just, it's just really painful, but the follow through and the consistency of kind of messaging and, be, and generating awareness, they falter quickly. And so employees learn to wait it out. You know, it basically, it, it feels like it's the program of the month. And that can be a risk, especially for folks that are launching innovation programs. I know you think about innovation in, in the realm of that world, but recognize that generally with, often with innovation programs, they feel a little bit like, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not like part of the core daily work that the person is being rated on. And so it is something they have to kind of buy into. And if you're going into an environment with a lot of these other kind of, you know, these, these issues with programs, you're going to, that's something that could actually uh, harm the innovation program. Now, on the plus side, the ones that make it work, you know, they're spare and sticky with their innovation programs. They're introduced periodically. Results are tracked for the program, which means there's a commitment to it. There's a basis for, as you go into the program, understanding what are the metrics we're going to track on the back side of it. Um, there's ongoing awareness and updates about the program. This is important. It makes, in other words, it's not the, a one-time splash and then kind of forgotten about, then, hey, it's on you employees to go and just participate on this thing. But it's, it's, it's continually renewed in terms of uh, awareness. And finally, executives walk the walk by participating publicly in the program. And when I say, uh, hopefully, I, you know, I'm referring to the phrase, you know, it's one thing to talk the talk, it's another to walk the walk. And so I actually say, I'm not only saying it's important for you, uh, us as a company that, you, that folks uh, do this, I, I'll demonstrate it by participating myself. So fixing the mistake with these programs, first I'll re retire the zombie programs. You know, there may have been something that was done a year old, is a year old, and it just hasn't actually, you know, never really got a lot of uptake. Maybe it's that wellness program. Um, you know, retire them. Actually, just stop, just take down the old posters and just stop worrying about whether you need to maintain anything on that. Assess outcomes expected for a program and compare it versus the other programs. Are the outcomes you expected at the front end matching, you know, the, you know matching what you, you you wanted? Measure results. Retire those that are not meeting them meaning your outcomes. Think in terms of calls on employees and time for all programs, and that's something to be mindful of, especially for the folks on the phone who are in, you know, managing innovation programs. Uh, and finally, with, that, with innovation, establish formal program management. And I have run into this. I, some, I will sometimes find situations where uh, I guess the innovation program management program is not formalized. It's formalized per se. It's more of a kind of a little bit loose. It's a little ad hoc. Someone's been charged to do it. You're talking with them, and it's got some potential, but if you formalize a program, it actually now starts to be something that's measured. Uh, it plugs into a lot of the awareness and the ongoing conversation of the uh, organization. So that's programs. Number four, no sense of what types of innovation are desired. Yeah, um, this, is, this is definitely one that I have run into, I've heard, and let's talk about that. I'm going to kind of, you know, types of innovation can certainly vary, but I want to kind of work to this specific definition in this case. Um, incremental, expansion, and transformative. The, you know, different levels of innovation. And you can sort of see, I've graphed them. You, you can take a look at it and say, you know, the rising level of benefit as you go along with different types. But the other thing is risk of failure goes too, right? So you got, uh, as you go along, and you try to achieve some of those more radical ones, yeah, your failure, risk of failure is definitely going to go up. So why, why it matters is to establish what types are desired. You know, employees understand the level of risk desired. And, you know, they know that. That actually helps guide them in terms of the ideas they would provide. They would provide. Uh, executives' expectations for what's needed uh, for innovation are set. In other words, if you've established what you're going to go after and from a, almost from a portfolio perspective, yeah, other executives understand, okay, so, you know, I understand roughly why we're doing the innovation we're doing the way of doing. And this third point is so important. Avoid a mismatch between the innovation desired and what can be handled. You know, it, you know talk about that here. It's, I talk about it here. This is the downside. Um, when expectations about innovation fail, and i got three of them here. First off, senior executives have this, no, this, this, this vision that they're going to have a pipeline full of big ideas. The problem is that they're unable to move these biggest ideas into development. And the cause is that the corporate resources and expectations are not established. Uh, it's one thing to pronounce that you want big ideas. It's another thing to actually be prepared to handle them. So that's one of the problems there. Expansion and transformative ideas are submitted, which is, you know, that's what you expect that's going to happen. I, you know, I'm going to get some really just awesome ideas. And then this is what happens. I'm only seeing these sort of smaller incremental ideas. Um, I think you know. I think I heard a uh, you know on one of the innovation leader webinar recently. A uh, uh, woman actually spoke about this being an issue. And you know, your risk culture internally might be have a bias towards incremental ideas. 
And then finally, an expectation of the pipeline of smaller workable, uh, workable ideas. In other words, what you wanted with innovation was just something, I'm, I'm just trying to get some small kind of wins, trying to build stuff. And then you start getting these crazy ideas that just will never fly, you know? Like people feel like, hey, you, you've opened up the, uh, you know, you've opened up the, the portal for me, I'm on it. So an issue there is, tends to be that communication, you know, the expectations have not been communicated as to what types of innovation are desired. And so these are some of the problems. So one of the things that is when you do understand, communicate what types of innovation you want, you can start thinking, all, really, start thinking of it as a portfolio of your innovation types. And I'm going to call out Google here. Uh, gosh, second reference to them here, right? But here they are. And uh, from 2007, but I think it was, you know, that, so Google has come a long way since then, but I think it's still true, and I think we can point to how well they've done. Their plan was this. 70% of their resources are basically, let's call it incremental, uh, the core business, which for them was internet search and advertising. 20% was expansion, going beyond that. So desktop, product search services, yeah, okay. And then they had the remaining 10% were these focus on highly experimental products. Innovation is important for the long term. And you know, some of the things we've heard about, some of which have worked well, some of which the risk of failure certainly comes about. Google Glass, they're, have to, they're doing a reset. Uh, the self-driving cars, that sounds like something that may have some real potential in the future. But that's okay. I mean, they're putting their, their you know, they're actually, they've allocated some of their types of innovation to be that kind of top right there, that, that transformative, knowing there's some risk, like a Google Glass. But what you, do, what you do see here is this is a company that knows where it's innovating, why it's innovating, and it can allocate its resources accordingly. So if there is a case where uh, executives have not yet really sort of established the types of innovation that are needed for the company, one, set the, set the target percentage of innovation investment. The 70-20-10 uh, is actually a great starting point. It doesn't have to be the only one. Uh, depending on the industry, it may make sense to actually have, you know, maybe actually have, you know, 80 uh, 15 and uh, 80, 80, 80, 15 and 5. But the, the, the point is, set the target percentages of it for innovation as, as, uh, investment. Two, ensure the company risk culture matches the desired innovation types. If there's going to be a meaningful percentage of those expansion and transformative type of ideas, it does take a different kind of thinking. Um, and you have to, it, it, it's sort of both the back end process has to change as well as almost cultural elements, which we're going to talk about as part of this, uh, my presentation today towards the end here. Um, source those ideas to match the desired portfolio. I mean, you're going to go after innovation in these different sectors. Actually ask for ideas that relate to the different things. And actually say, you know, run campaigns for the different types of innovation you're going to be going after. And finally, line up the resources, the processes, the personnel to fulfill those desired types. Kind of a follow-up on there to uh, make sure that you know, you know, you've got things in set for that. So that's an important point there when you think about that. And if you think about right now your own company, how well has it been articulated what types of innovation? Uh, if you feel like it's a little loose, um, I think it's, it's highly worth doing a little research and determining what levels would be appropriate for your company with its culture. Number five, no executive sponsorship for the innovation program. Yeah, so the innovation program ideally has someone, preferably at the C-suite level, who is actually a backer. Um, often that may not be the case, but somebody who might be an EVP-like type level. So why it matters? It's credibility. I mean, it's a signal of the importance for innovation program. People will take their cue from who's backing a particular program. And uh, if to the extent that it's got a kind of a very highly placed executive behind it, um, it goes a long way towards that credibility. Uh, this person also has helped become a decision maker on key issues. You're going to run into this. If you're running an innovation program, you probably understand some of what I'm talking about here. But there are going to be key decisions about things. Let's go back to the portfolio I just talked about in the preceding uh, slides there. Um, it's going to be important to have these folks to help guide and help allocate resources. They can also be useful for clearing obstacles to a smoothly operating program. Yeah, again, I've probably, I bet folks on the phone have run into this. You know, some sort of something, some hurdle, something that you go, ah, you know, it just kills you. It's really nice when you have that sort of senior executive who's well-placed can help kind of move, nudge things along. And finally, keep innovation atop the corporate agenda. This person will actually be in those meetings where you can't be and certainly can ensure that others are aware of what's going on with the innovation program. When things aren't, when you don't have this, I like to call, like it to push you on a string. Basically, the poor innovation program manager is trying to get sort of buy-off from the different business units, and it push on a string, I think, hopefully, that it's a great, uh, a great metaphor for what that feels like. You're, you're trying really hard, but it's really a constant struggle, Try, constantly to get folks to buy off and participate in the innovation program. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's only the innovation team that's, that's actually supporting it. Uh, senior leaders, 
they haven't been primed to understand the innovation efforts. I mean, it's, you know, no, there's been no sort of from the top kind of understanding for, uh, to let folks know about things. Internal resources, hard to secure for the innovation effort. Employees don't understand how the innovation program fits the company's agenda. It's, just, it's not really clear. There's some sort of innovation group telling me they're trying to run some stuff. Meanwhile, when you have it, <laughs> you got this happy guy here. Things are jumping. Uh, you've got your go-to resource to help resolve the timing, the things around timing, when we're going to launch, when we're going to have this thing ready, what, all those elements. Your resources, be it marketing, uh, uh, in, you know, capital, that, you know, it, it's, you know, let's say risk capital for investing in, in the innovations. Uh, agenda, there's going to be things, there's going to be time, something conflicts, helping resolve those things. Other support units, the, again, go to, go to marketing, uh, maybe to HR, um, maybe it's the PMO group, but they're aligned to the innovation program effort. And awareness is generated throughout all levels of the company, and uh, that's really important. And I say all levels in the sense that um, the internal comms team often will be enlisted as part of the, the uh, innovation uh, program rollout. But certainly, as those boardroom type conversations, those sort of senior executive conversations, you want to make sure that awareness continues there as well. And that's what it feels like. I mean, you've got that. You, you, it's not like you're pushing on the string to try to gain it. You've already got that. Fiction, if you don't have that to date, First thing is review the background for the innovation became of interest. Think about why you're putting in place an innovation program. And generally, if you think back to it, there was probably some executive, some part of the organization where it's relevant. Revisit that. That person would be one of the initial candidates, if they're not now, to come back to and talk about as the executive sponsor. And identify senior leaders with a strong reputation and a future orientation. The future orientation is a good thought because uh, I did find some interesting research where um, there, you know, people actually do vary in terms of their orientation towards the present or the future. And I think innovation fits well with a, an executive who has more of a future orientation um, because that's, it really is a forward-looking exercise. And so getting someone that has more of that is, is valuable. And finally, develop your pitch for outlining the value of innovation. What's needed. If that, you don't have that person now, develop a pitch. Talk about why this is important for the company, where you want to, you know, where you want to take it, and what the value of the uh, sponsorship will be. Number six, no ownership by the business unit leads of the innovation program. Okay, so if we, exact, let me talk about this, contrast that with what we just did, number five. Number five was about an executive sponsor, okay? And that's to help, again, uh, guidance, help get things, kind of clear the obstacles. This one is about where, I guess you could say, the innovation you know, rubber meets the road, where things really happen in terms of you know, innovation activities. And that's going to be, that really, that comes best from your business unit leads, which is important that they actually have ownership in the innovation program. Now, why it matters, I'm talking about seven ways these business unit executives are the perfect place to get things done. GTD, uh, a popular uh, acronym a lot of folks probably on the phone would be familiar with. Um, first off, you want to know, they, the, the business unit executives, they know where to target innovation in the business units. They are intimately familiar with where things need to happen for their own business units. Employees will respond more actively to a call from the senior leader. Just an, it's the nature of the beast. It's the it's the way work it, it is for in work. If some senior executive makes a call for uh, you know on a project or for innovation, uh, yeah, it's going to get more attention. It signals the importance of the innovation program. When you've got the business lead kind of as the leading the innovation charge, yeah, it's become, it definitely elevates the importance in everyone's eyes. Um, <clears throat> they know the high level career criteria they would have for evaluating selecting ideas. They are able to prioritize selected ideas to be developed. They can allocate the resources both to the innovation effort and to develop those selected ideas, and they can ensure things get done. And that's just a general statement. Like, you know what? This isn't happening. Hey, so-and-so, I need you to prioritize this. By next week, we have something. I mean, they, know how to, they can make things happen. And so it's really important and really valuable to get their buy-off in the program. It's almost like another version of if you don't have this, you're pushing on a string. Yeah, so almost like, again, going back to this, for the downside would be if you don't have the business unit head leads as a part of, you know, buying off and having, feeling some ownership in the innovation program, it's really tough. You're kind of, you're kind of trying to get innovation, you're launching campaigns, but it, it feels like, as I say, some, some faraway group is actually asking for, is asking for participation, it's, which definitely reduces the level of participation. You know, innovation efforts, because it's coming from this sort of, some sort of innovation group. I don't know who they are, and but my, you know, I know what, you know, I know the stuff I got to get done today. For all, you know, suddenly it's like number twelve on the employees to do this list, right? To do to participate in an innovation effort. Um, 
Yeah, in fact, it's even possible you might get a business unit leader who, because they have not had ownership involved in the program, they may actively discourage participation. Don't worry about that. We need to get focused on for the things this quarter. Yeah, that happens. And then finally, ideas of potential that do actually do, would actually emerge have a hard time getting traction inside the business unit. In other words, you're trying to get this business unit to buy off on some idea that they didn't really have, there was no ownership uh, from the top. And so it's a little hard to have them sort of say, uh, you know, get them to, to participate on that. Um, when it's working, you're going to have, you know, take a number, please. I mean, and I've seen this. You know, there'll actually be a queue of folks waiting to actually run their own campaigns. So, <clears throat> you know, business unit leaders are regularly reaching out to run the campaigns, run campaigns. You know, innovation feels like it's just another part of employees' jobs. I mean, especially when done right and it's coming from the business unit leader. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's almost like a part of the work you do, not less of a kind of an, an extracurricular effort from some distant group that's running it. Um, prior campaigns, they've spawned innovation projects. In other words, you can sort of almost, you could walk to the different offices of the different business units and you could almost point to, oh yeah, that came from the program, oh yeah, that came from the innovation program. And you just know it, and it feels good. It feels like, yeah, we're getting results, things are happening for us. And running campaigns becomes a top option to address opportunities. Think about that. There's going to be cases where uh, new opportunities or even like problems emerge. You know, how are we going to how are we going to resolve this? Well, one of the options, you know, there'll be others, but one of the options would be let's actually get a campaign around this. That's the way it's going to feel. Now, if you're not if it's not happening, you don't have the business unit uh, leads uh, invested in owning this. Um, first off, make sure you've got a campaign-based approach to your innovation program. That's one of, probably one of the most important things I can call out. Campaigns will focus on particular. Uh, tangible needs and that's right up the right up the alley of where you you know what an innovate a business unit uh, leader has to focus on so that leverage your senior executive sponsor go back to that prior one if you don't have one ideally you, you get that one of the things I talked about is they are able to actually now help align things and they can actually help align a business leader business unit head leaders seek out the business unit leaders that have early adopter characteristics um, there are some characteristics that I think mark the folks that are good candidates if, they, if you don't have them now. Um, one of the things is almost like the adoption uh, diffusion curve. Think of some early adopter business units. Those are your targets to start out. And finally, start the innovation effort by focusing on more tactical campaigns early. Make it something where you can get quick results. People can see the value of this. Uh, it may not be those sort of expansion and transformative type of uh, campaigns, but that's okay at the start. Number seven. One the big issue is not focusing on tangible business outcomes. Um, that's you know one of the things. The reason you're doing innovation is to actually help move the company forward. That means tangible business outcomes. It's going to be things like its growth, its profitability, yeah, it's actually moving to new markets, it's happy customers, it's employees that are jazzed. That's important. Mistake would be that when you have your innovation program, it's not focusing on that. Um, so why it matters? <clears throat> you know, it's the road to making collaborative innovation. The way we work. I mean, it, ultimately, I think that, 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 let's stop for a second on that. that. That's really the ultimate objective, where the innovation is just a part and parcel of how we get things done around here. Uh, how, it's almost like, how will we not do this? Um, so my focus on tangible business questions, is, it's, it actually elevates the credibility of the innovation program. It may, provides relevance to what employees see, hear, and work on regularly. It demonstrates that executives are taking the involvement seriously. In other words, they, you know, these are important things for the company, and we want you to help solve them. And it puts employees' incredibly valuable diversity of insight to work on advancing the company. And that's really what you're trying to achieve here. When things aren't working, I like to call it fluffy. Fluffy the innovation pet. And this is a problem. Sometimes can't, I've seen this where innovation programs kind of people are a little unsure like how to get going on, on uh, different topics and rather than get try to figure out the right tangible business uh, questions it comes well let's do some lighter fare just so people can see how they you participate show off the software you know okay you can do that you know, you know things like how do we, you know where are we going to pick the location of the divisional picnic um, or I've seen this and god this is one of the worst ones you know there's some old issue that really no one cares about and really has not gotten a lot of action well let's run a campaign on it and even if you run a campaign, you're not going to get a whole lot of like follow-up thereafter. It, you know, so it's all fluffy. The innovation pet. So the problem, your risk there is the innovation program becomes associated with lightweight topics. Um, and the other thing, it can become a dumping ground for issues that no one cares about, I and mean, that's just going to undermine the effectiveness of it. And you may actually, if you haven't got campaigns, you've got this open suggestion box. You get stuck with unworkable ideas that are just 
really just too easy to ignore. There's just no way we're going to get to that. I got to move on. And it's just that thing just gets set aside. When it, you do have those tangible business outcomes as a, your focus, you know, it's a real business tool. You know, and just give some examples of things that will happen that you will see. You know, growth in our market, our core market is slowing. Yeah, okay, that's real. It happens. You know, one of the things that folks are going to be, especially the front line, how can we address more of our customers' jobs to be done? The things they're trying to accomplish now that we could actually do much better. It might be in adjacent markets. That's great expansion kind of opportunity. And the thing is, you've got folks who are working with your customers right now that can give you information on that. Customer delight has become a brand differentiator. And then, but unfortunately, you know, here's an example, the company's net promoter score is pretty low. Well, how can we better serve customers at every touch point? Who is best placed to understand where the customer pain points are and what might be some ways to resolve it? The folks that are working with them. Again, that's a tangible business outcome that is proper, you know, exactly placed to get customer, you know, your employees involved. In a one now culture, our delivery performance is just average. Well, how can we reduce the time from order to receipt? And then think about that whole chain. You've got folks that are smart, that probably have some interesting perspectives. Bring them into that process. Help think about that. So fixing a mistake. Yeah, tie campaign topics to that mission and those strategic imperatives I talked about earlier. That right off the bat. That helps immediately ground it in much more tangible outcomes. Have the business unit leader describe areas of underperformance. Every business unit is going to have that. Something that's just not is performing at the level that uh, she or he would want. Find out about those. And then here's some prompts that you can use to help shake loose highly valuable campaign topics. So you think about those under areas of underperformance. Well, what issues are causing it? And you know, you might even go you know, pursue the five whys technique of just that why, why, you know, in that kind of conversation. What issues are benefit from employees on the ground perspective? The previous slide I talked about a couple where it's just a natural you'd use you'd leverage their expertise. Uh, what areas repeatedly get feedback from many employees but haven't been effectively channeled for resolution? Okay, that happens. I think it, I've yet to find an organization where there's some kind of activity that there's a lot of feedback, but it's again via a conference call or email or separate distinct little meetings. And what events are happening in the next four to eight quarters that we can get a head start on today? Think about those. So those are some ways to start generating much more tangible business outcomes, uh, business questions for your uh, innovation program. Number eight. Hey, do you executives care about this? One of the problems will be executives are busy. And we are, I, you know what, I get that. Totally busy. Traveling, back-to-back -back meetings, a lot going on. That being said, if there's like zero involvement in the innovation program from their perspective in terms of engaging and being there, um, it makes people wonder. It, actually, this, it, it can definitely diminish and undermine participation from employees. So why it matters, it's a confirmation, you know, when, when they're actually engaged, you get confirmation they're listening. And then that's one of the most important things with this, is that it's collaborative and that the powers of B are very interested in are listening to what uh, employees are suggesting. Credibility, I talked about walk the walk before. You know, that's actually when, when the senior executives are engaged with employees on the innovation program, yeah, they're walking the walk. It goes to the credibility of the program. Break down the org chart barriers to communication. Well, that's one of the things a lot of folks would love to have more because they, they always wonder, you know, you see some kind of uh, email comes out from on high, but you don't really get a, you know, a good chance to understand more fully what someone's thinking. And so one of the things that a collaborative innovation program does, it can actually break down some of those or, you know, organizational chart barriers to communication. And finally, one of the things that's really bad for senior executives is learn what's happening at ground level. Um, it, you know, in, your, in their busy days, it can be really hard to stay on top of what are the things that are really animating, getting buzz, that I, should, I need to know about from employees? And you know what? Your collaborative innovation program is a, is a perfect vessel for that. So when they're not engaged, uh, you're not getting senior executive involvement. You know, employee innovation just does, comes by, it's just it's not important enough to warrant engagement communication. You know, it just, it's, it's a nice little thing you guys are doing, but I got more important things to worry about. Which, of course, leads to, well, how credible is this innovation program? That's an employee's perspective. The innovation program feels divorced from what animates company leadership, and uh, that's that, you know mind the gap. That's a, that's a, that's something that's a real risk. And finally, executives they don't have a good feel of what's happening on the ground. Um, definitely something I think you know most enlightened executives would, would admit they can't be on top of everything, all the things that are going on, and they don't really have a good way of channeling into what is happening uh, on the ground with employees. And uh, certainly when they, when they're not engaged, they don't have any any really any good path to do that. Yeah, now the ones on the plus side, they're talking the talk. And I say that, you know, kind of a little tongue-in-cheek there with walk the walk. But <clears throat> they're participating in communications. They show they know about the different contributions. Uh, and that can be things such as just a kind of, you know, uh, complimenting someone on an idea or a comment. 
Um, they can actually, when uh, you know, there's no updates around the program, the senior executive might actually send out a, 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 be part of the email that sends it, it gets sent out as an example of the newsletter and just notes really interesting contributions. Employees have a regular connection with leaders in a structured, focused way, and that's important. I just want to call that out. One of the things that I don't, I think a lot of senior executives would probably not want to have is just online, nothing but gripe sessions. And I, you can sort of appreciate that. Um, one of the things with the, when you have campaigns and innovation program, it is a structured, focused way to have conversations around a particular topic. That actually, I think, actually helps uh, augment, uh, you know, their, the, the interest uh, and kind of, you know, make it, makes it so that the senior executives feel like, okay, this is actually going to be a constructive uh, dialogue I'm going to have, not just sort of a rant session. And finally, leaders, you know, when, they, when it's going well, they want the tough feedback. And they praise good analysis. They like that. That's actually, I think that's one of the things that I think most employees would just dream of, a chance to actually articulate things that maybe could be done better and have an executive say, that's great, and actually that's something that uh, you know, I want to take into account. I think that's like a dream for employees. So fix a mistake. Make it easy for these executives. Prepare with selected content. You may want to actually do a little curation on some of the most interesting content from, a, let's say, a given campaign. Um, find a window. For engagement, again, these execs are traveling, so maybe it might be something where you can just do a quick uh, five, ten minute call, maybe a brief visit to the office, and then the means to do so. Um, one thought, bring an iPad, have it, have it ready, have it, the executive signed in, and all they have to do is just do a few comments here and there. That, goes, that does wonders uh, for showing engagement. Um, the campaign and program update communications, uh, they, they come from a senior leader. Actually, that's a great chance. When they actually send out, when it comes under their email, um, that goes a long way. It says, okay, so-and-so actually came out from that, that person's name. I think that means a lot. Um, and finally, leaders, just this is number three, this is actually one of the things to be careful of. Leaders can have an outsized, outsized effect on perceptions of people's ideas and comments. So they need to take care with what's communicated. I mean, as soon as someone comes and says, this is the best idea of this whole campaign, if that was a comment, you can imagine what the effect on everyone else will be. So there's probably does need some care taken with what types of uh, engagement would be, uh, you know, would be put out there by the... Um, the senior executives. So. Number nine. Why do people post so many lousy ideas? This is this is this would be a case where senior executives are just like they can't believe this innovation program. Man, this is just a bunch of just let's just just say crap. Um, yeah, if they start putting that kind of vibe out there. Well, that's uh, that's a problem because it be, now the what the way senior executives actually talk about the ideas that are submitted. You know, it has a big impact on the internal, internal risk-taking culture. Um, employees are attuned to how they're perceived by participating. I mean, this is a public comments. It's the comments in the public in the sense of um, amongst my own employees and my the executives. And they'll be attuned to what the kind of feedback comes, you know, is being said about what they contribute. Um, past behaviors affect future participation in innovation. Um, so certainly uh, being open to kind of novel ideas can help uh, foster, you know, in, you know increased participation and more novel ideas. If on the flip side you feel like everything's just lousy and you keep saying it, um, you might have that might have an icing effect out there. And finally, people's willingness to share anything, not just the innovation program, but just anything. Um, it's going to be impacted by response to the non-starter. And certainly if it's a if it's done negatively, you may actually have consequences outside of just your innovation program in terms of people's perceptions of why they should be contributing anything anywhere. So and the downside, when executives are too harsh and kind of have these statements, the, these almost ad hominem statements about how crappy the ideas are, you know, you, you're basically putting in place an innovation winter. You know, you get executives who are frustrated by the lack of usable ideas. The ideation activity, it grinds to a halt. I mean, God, that's going to be the reaction. Why bother? I got, I, I got my, you know, my stuff I'm going to get a radio. I'm going to work on that instead. You get employees afraid to post their ideas. And, you, you know, this is probably the worst thing of all. A conservative, risk-averse culture can set in. You know, whereas when it's done right, when, when, when the senior executives actually have a really positive out attitude about the fact that they're getting contributions from the employees, the try, that good kind of uh, sort of problem resolution, outcome-driven types of thinking around the ideas, I mean, you know, you get employees who, you know, they'll talk about it, and you get employees who understand what leadership is seeking in ideas. I mean, they understand that, oh, okay, so I understand that these are the kind of general areas where um, ideas, you know, where they're seeking ideas, that helps me be better in my submissions. Um, employees have a well-developed nose for ideas that have good potential. Um, yeah, that just happens naturally. It's almost like muscle memory starts to kick in. Uh, innovation program has a number of, let me quote here, 
wow, that's a great idea. Where'd that come from? Has a lot of those kinds of ideas because you've actually, you've really, through the executive, have fostered kind of a culture that embraces occasionally some sort of you know, out there, you know, left, out of left field ideas. And finally, culture is one where smart risk taking is a regular part of doing business. And I think, again, that is one of those th areas that I think is just what I think is a dream for employees. I think for you as innovation practitioners is, is an area, you, something you want to see. And I think it's generally one of the things that companies want to see, that they really want to see as well. So fixing the mistake, um, you know, at the start of campaigns, provide guidance. This is one of the things that we just, we often counsel in our kind of consulting engagement with clients is, it's sort of, you know, make sure that uh, as you launch the campaign, folks have a pretty good sense of what are the characteristics of a good solution. You don't want to pigeonhole it into, you know, too tight a window, but just give some general sense. So that helps people understand kind of what's called guardrails. Feedback on why a particularly interesting idea wasn't selected. Let folks know. Um, sometimes, you know, especially with those more interesting novel ideas, I mean, they may have the kernel of something good. Well, let folks know why it couldn't be up to, taken up, but it's a positive message. Yeah, at least people, people will actually accept uh, understand, you know, information telling them why it wasn't accepted versus like nothing at all or just, you know, you know just slamming the idea. Uh, novel ideas that aren't selected are, are celebrated in communications. And uh, number four, give, give awards to the most interesting ideas that aren't selected. Yeah, I've seen companies do this. This is actually pretty cool. You actually have the celebration of the great, the most interesting potential, uh, possible ideas that you didn't take up. You do that, you, I, can t I can tell you exactly what's going to happen. That is a behavior that's going to drive change in culture inside your organization. Last one, and we are coming up. I'm timing it right here, I think. Number ten, this would be a downside. This is the this is the mistake. Your idea failed, you failed. I mean, in other words, you personalize it and you make it feel like this is a real black mark on someone's, uh, um, you know, on their career. Internally, they've now they've lost reputation, and this becomes a hindrance to their move, advancing forward in the company. Why it matters, you know, done right, um, you're going to develop like a learning culture. Uh, when you run these ideas and there's a failure, you can certainly, that becomes a base of learning. Uh, you'll get insights from the failure. And finally, this is an important thing. If an idea, you try ideas and they don't work, uh, depending on how you handle them, it becomes the basis for attracting new talent, fresh thinking in your organization. If the organization gets a reputation for, uh, you know, real ne being real negative for people that try new things, can you guess what's going to happen? Word will get out, you know, glassdoor.com or somewhere else. And try to imagine attracting new, fresh talent into your company. Yeah, so let's talk about the negative. You know, no one wants to try new things because it means putting their job on the line. If I'm going to get a black market, this doesn't work, <laughs> I'm going to opt out. Only the most incremental, safe ideas will ever get worked on. And that is just like, that, that's the one of the things that can kill, uh, you know, in terms of innovation. One, you're, you're, basically, all it is is let's just go safe, very small, almost imperceptible value on these things. Company cannot attract or retain novel thinkers, and the diversity of insight suffers. Just that's that that might be the worst thing of all, actually, of all of it. Uh, you basically, it, there's it becomes a, you know, thing, a hardening of the arteries for the company as you don't get the fresh blood coming in. In innovation, positive culture. Basically, you know, you actually you know, successful innovations are spawned from the learnings of failed ideas. This happens. So you try an idea, you put it out there, didn't work, but what did you learn from that? Because that actually can drive future innovations. You have actually have a culture that you know actually recognizes that we need to try some things and there will be some failure. So you have a test, learn, iterate culture. And when like, here's the thing that happens when you've got that in place and there's real actual activities people can point to and say, yeah, that's actually how we work. The reputation as a company uh, is burnished with leading edge as a leading edge thinking uh, environment and it's an interesting place to work. And guess what that does for recruiting and getting people in there. So fix the mistake. Implement a process for identifying points of uncertainty in a potential idea. Try as best you can to not just sort of just put it out there. Maybe do a little thinking ahead of time. Where are the points of uncertainty around this? Um, pursue smaller scale experiments to test assumptions and to resolve those points of uncertainty. And identify learnings from failed ideas. Celebrate the process. We didn't, we, fa we didn't, you know, as, as I've had here with Thomas Edison, we didn't fail. We just actually learned some things that don't work. And we learned some things we think that might work because, based on the experiment. That's actually the mentality. Again, it's a dream for employees, and I think it's a dream for innovation practitioners around this. I will say this. Uh, on our website, we do have a, uh, uh, you can actually download a, uh, a survey. It's 20, it includes these plus some others, 25 behaviors affecting your program success. Um, you, you've got, I've got the link there. It's on, it's on the Hype uh, Innovation blog. Um, you can go there. The blog will get a little set up, and then you can go through and um, click to actually uh, get access to the actual uh, 
survey itself. And it's something that you'll probably find useful. Uh, again, it's going to cover the 10 things I just talked about here, along with 15 other things that uh, affect the program. All right. And with that, that's a wrap. Time for Q&A. And I know we're almost out of time, so let's see here. <clears throat> How do you define and communicate what is in it for me at the employee level? Sure. I think um, one of the things that for folks will be, um, you know, I, I, I like to think, I think that folks, you've got, obviously it varies by employee, but some examples. Um, first off, when people with recognition in of itself, it becomes a huge element of it. And I talked about a couple different cases here about um, the, you know, the need for communicating and celebrating people's participation, either on the good or, you know, let's say, uh, things that don't work out. Um, I think that one of the strongest things you can do for employees is acknowledge their, their, their contributions, and when they do it well, to uh, provide, give them status inside the organization, inside the company. Um, that is a huge thing that's what's in it for me. Another thing that's what's in it for me would be um, how do you, uh, um, are, you, are you allowing folks to actually help participate in the development of the idea? That's actually really, really good. Um, <clears throat> because a lot of folks, you know, they, the, the, the reason they came up with the idea is because either it's a, it's a pain point for them or they had a chance to get, you know, they really exercised their creative muscle. And the chance to pursue that is, is powerful for a lot of folks. Not every, folk, not every person wants to do that. But for a lot of folks, if you can do it, and again, I know there's HR policies and there's also, you know, people that are kind of really have a lot on their plate with existing work. But to the extent they can actually become participants and help see the, see the idea into reality, that is one of those things that allows folks to step out of just the thing they're working on and take on a bit more of a cre creativity, uh, a bit more problem solving, and it kind of burnishes their credentials, to be honest. Again, and that's actually one of the things that from a career trajectory, a lot of folks like to do as well. So I think there's a couple areas that um, you can touch on that can be really powerful for employees. There are rewards programs you can also put in place. Um, there's smart ways to do it and not so smart ways to do it. I did do a gamification web webinar previously, but certainly we feel free to reach out if you want to have a conversation a little bit more about that part, the particular thing as well. And Mitch, I know I do see that we are at the top of the hour now. <laughs>